and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. A Sunday morning, hallelujah, and it's lasting all week long. Can you hear? Good morning, everybody. Um, it's great to be back with you. We were really looking forward to this this morning. So would you stand and receive this call to worship? It com comes from Psalm 73, verses 23 through 26. And it says, I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterwards, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may, feel, may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So let's go to our Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for waking us up again. Thank you for putting the breath in our lungs so that we can continue to live um, and bring glory to you. And we pray that that's what we do this morning, God, that our hearts, um, that our words sung and said bring glory and honor to you this morning. Jesus, thank you for being our Lord and portion forever. Thank you for being a place that we can run to um, because we know that you're enough. We know that you're enough to fill the longings and desires in our hearts because you, God, are our portion forever. Thank you for this time this morning. We pray that you bless it. In your name we pray, amen.
Jesus, you are so good and you are enough for us. You're enough to fill that aching space in our heart. And we just thank you. We thank you that you are God that we can come before as who we are. We don't have to pretend. We don't have to be somebody we're not, but we can come before you and know that you see us as your children. And we thank you for that. Jesus, we just pray that you open our hearts and our minds to receive what you're saying, God. Take down the walls that we've built in our hearts and the spaces that we've tried to keep you out of, God so that we may know you more today. It's in your name we pray, amen. Well, hello. That's <laughs> good. I like, I like a little callback. I like that. Hey, what did you all choose to fast over yesterday? I mean, not just yesterday, but what would you choose? First winner, first person gets a prize. I lied, there's no prize. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think now is a prime time, if there ever was one, in the history of the world, to double down for the sake of Jesus. Um, let me just encourage you in this way. No one's going to come do it for you. It won't happen with your parents. It won't happen at your churches. If, if you're looking for 
a life-changing experience, uh, what I think is a renewal of the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you really do believe that God could make dead things alive again, uh, part of it will just, it'll take you throwing yourself down before Jesus and saying, uh, I, I want what you have for me. I want what you have for me. You know, I see this all over the country. I've got friends who pastor churches, who uh, lead students from, you know, not just the United States, but all over the world. And, and what I see is that there is a hunger, I think, of people in your age range where it, you've been called the next generation for too long. And I think part of that is stuck a little bit. But what I've found, what I'm learning is, is that this is the most spiritually vibrant generation. And I think if they catch on to what Jesus is doing, you, you all will change the world. So on that note, let me, just, let me just pray and we'll ask the Lord to help us. Uh, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we come and give thanks on just a beautiful morning. Lord, we thank you for the sunshine. We thank you for the provision uh, of snow and rain. Lord, the, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, as your scripture says. And Lord, uh, we're just so, we're so grateful for your kindness, for your thoughtfulness and attentive to, attentiveness to us. Lord, that you, you don't turn an eye to your children. You are present. You are intimately involved. And God, I'm just so grateful uh, for this opportunity, for this moment. And I believe that by your power and by your strength, uh, we'll see a work that you are doing amongst this place. And we pray this in your holy and precious name. Amen. All right, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. There was a woman named Florence Nightingale, and I think she died somewhere around 1910. She's considered to be the founder of modern nursing, and she had a little quote that I think about from time to time. She said this. She said, unnecessary noise is the most cruel abuse of care, which can be inflicted on either the sick or the well. Florence was convinced that noise doesn't help anybody. She believed that Noise was actually the thing that was preventing her patients from healing. And when I think of this idea of noise, I think of an empty sound, meaning that I can hear it, but I can't quite distinguish what it is. Where, where I live in the San Francisco Bay Area in California, uh, if I drive about 20 minutes from my house, I can find all sorts of noise. I can find traffic, people, car engines, gunshots, now, nah, that last one wasn't real, but I figured I'd throw it in there. I hear all sorts of noise. And what I find is that when the noise is too much, you know, one of the things that we do is we just, we just don't want to listen to it. It's not worth listening to. Now, if I drive that far away, I can find all sorts of noise. But where I live at my house, it's quiet. Have you ever been somewhere like maybe out in the country and it's so quiet that it's honestly scary? And like you don't want to go outside to go get the dog because you're afraid that something in the dark will get you. Like I know exactly because you run as soon as you as fast as you possibly can to get back inside. I still do that actually. And my ten year old, uh, we, he he goes and he takes the trash out. And uh, sometimes I've shut the front porch light off and and locked the front door. <laughs> Terrible, I know. Uh, the the town where I live um, has lots and lots of people who want to live there because it is so quiet. Because this is a place where you can hear things that matter. You know, one of the things I love about living in my particular neighborhood, I live in a cul-de-sac, and so that means that there's a little turnaround at the end of the street, and we live right near the little turnaround. And our neighborhood is filled with kids. And right in front of our front window is this walkthrough where our kids can safely walk to school uh, a couple blocks over. It takes them about five minutes to walk to school. In our neighborhood, we can hear kids playing outside. Uh, in my neighborhood, I can talk to my neighbors. In my neighborhood, uh, I can even hear, you know, when there's a game at the football field on Friday nights. You know, these sounds are not, are not empty. These sounds are full. They're important. They're, they're about people that we love and that we know. And so I, I want to continue in this kind of this, this vein of thought about an empty sound and a very, very full sound. And I want to take us back to the book of Colossians again this morning, where Paul is going to compare something that's empty to something that's very full. Um, and I, I think we should be clear about this. Um, Paul is talking about a kind of living. 
there's a kind of living that can be really, really empty, and there's a kind of living that can be really, really, really full. And, and almost 2,000 years ago, the people in Colossae were susceptible to believing a lie. And, and at its core, it was a lie like this, that there is some kind of belief, there's some kind of system of thought that is out there in the world that is going to elevate of something of higher value than Jesus. Now, we don't know what that is. It's not explicitly clear as we read this book of the Bible. But we do know that it was a lot like noise. I want to read something to you that Paul says in, in verse 8 of Colossians 2. Colossians 2, he says, it was, it was hollow and deceptive, just empty noise, just rattling around. But the concern for Paul is that this kind of noise can wind up taking you as a prisoner. Listen to what he says in verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive. You know, language is important. Words matter. Words build worlds. This is a good quote by Rudyard Kipling. Ideas, these are important too. Ideology is a very popular phrase in our culture at the time. These are all things, whether it be language or whether it be ideas, these are all things that can end up taking you prisoner. You know, I don't know if you know this, but there is a battle going on for your heart, kind of that seat of your desires. There's a war that is waging for who you're supposed to become on the inside. There's, there's kind of a, there's a massive war waging kind of at the very core of who we are supposed to become in Jesus. And Paul's concern is that you can become a casualty of this war. You can become a prisoner of war if you are not careful. Now, when we read passages like this, they are not meant to scare us, but they're meant to sober us up a little bit. They're, they're meant to kind of open our eyes to this reality that we don't normally pay attention to, and it's kind of this business where you go, hey, you got to take this seriously. Your life matters. Your future matters. This present moment matters. you got to pay attention to this. Now, this is, this is so serious because this is something that people could and probably were turning from Jesus to something else. They were casualties of war. They were prisoners, if you would. Now, what they turned towards is probably a little different than what you might turn toward today. But I think the threat is still the same for us to consider as we look at Colossians chapter 2. Because there will be an emptiness that promises fullness that you will become enslaved to. There's an emptiness that sounds a lot like fullness that has nothing to offer you, and you will spend your life in service of that thing. And I think for most of us, and by us I mean you, the emptiness and the kind of the most tempting part about this whole deceptive reality is your identity. People will try to convince you that you are something, you are somebody that you are not, and God God, God created, maybe he created you wrong. Maybe he gave you a different desire. Whatever it is, it, it will surround you. It's vile. It's militant. And its purpose is meant to assault you. Your identity is at the core of who you are, who God made you to be. And he doesn't make mistakes. But what, is he, what he is doing is he is cultivating the sense of who you are over time. Like the best version of yourself is still... You know, you're leveling up all the time. It's happening in every single moment. Your identity is important because you've got to start asking yourself some questions like, who am I apart from my achievements? Why is my home life so different from my school life, which is so different from my church life? Why do I act differently around this group of people than from that group of people? Who will I be when I leave home and go to college? What if I don't know that Jesus or this whole Christian thing is real? What if it doesn't feel good anymore? What if it isn't helping people, it's only damaging relationships and you see it all the time? What do you do? Quick question. How many of you felt like you just identified with one of those statements that I just said? There are a lot of things coming your way who want to speak into who you're called to be. And at some point, it's all just noise. Empty sound, but we, we just don't know quite how to tell what it is. But Paul knows something differently. He, he knows that a life with Jesus is not empty. It, it's actually full. 
And Paul is beginning to compare the two. Like, what's of greater value here? You know, he, he says in verse 8, he says, empty living. He says, this is the thing that depends on human tradition and what Paul calls the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Jesus. And, you know, there's this emptiness through the noise that we hear, and it's not from God, it's from other people. And it doesn't depend on Jesus. Emptiness is something that doesn't depend on Jesus. So here's what I want you to hear. I am less concerned about who you are in comparison to your achievements. As much as I am concerned about who you are when no one is watching. I want to know what your character's like. I think Jesus wants to know, what's the sum of your heart? Where are your desires directed and aimed towards? I'm less concerned about the gap between home, church, and school. As I am to who you are around those people in those environments. Who are you to your parents and your siblings? Are you a nightmare? Are you difficult? Are you combative? Are you mean-spirited? Who are you to your peers at school? Are you merciless and unjust? How are you to those who show up at your church? You put on a good face, but you're dying on the inside. My question that I think we ought to begin to consider is, look, the world is going to go on, and you're going to go along with it, but you got to begin to ask the question, do you reflect Jesus? Because people are watching you. You're just a living testimony of what God is doing in the world through his son, Jesus. We don't belong for ourselves. Like That's one of the main themes of the New Testament. My life is not my own. It's been bought with at a heavy, heavy, heavy price being the son of God. And do I reflect Jesus in my identity, at the core of who I am? So I'm less concerned about trying to explain all of the bad ways that we trash the name of Jesus, and I'm not here to defend that to you today. But I just want to remind you of who you are in Jesus Christ. So do we, do we begin to see a little bit of the difference here of how he's comparing something between that's empty and something that's, that's full? Now, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on, on this today, but, but I think it's important nonetheless of what Paul says in verses 6 and 7. He says, just as you've received King Jesus, continue to live your lives in him. It's a, day thing. It's a daily thing. He says, you should be rooted and built up, Paul says. So you have to make a daily decision to put your roots down into Christ and you'll grow. I think that's one of the promises in Scripture, that you will grow far beyond your wildest expectations and imagination. And not only that, but we talked about this yesterday, but your faith will become firm and you'll be overflowing with gratitude at what God is doing in your life. I have a friend who said this to me the other day. He says, if the joy of the Lord is our strength, then our faces should show it. I don't have anything to worry about. My life is not my own. Paul says in Philippians, he says, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's a win-win game when you're with Jesus. I win no matter what. I've been, I have won the victory through what Jesus has done at the cross. I should be the most joyous person in the entire world. I have nothing to fear, nothing to worry about. I have no anxiety that could cripple me in the kingdom of God because my life is not dependent upon me. There's nothing empty here. Everything is full. And I think that's what you get when you stick with Jesus, when you wake up every day knowing that Jesus is enough for you, that your life will become full and not empty. So Paul, he explains it like this in verses 9 and 10. He says, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Just that God put on flesh and came and dwelt among us. And in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and every authority. And we, we already talked about this on Monday, that if, if Jesus is everything that God is, and he was God's response to everything wrong, that in his death, everything could be made right through Jesus. And we live for him because of him. And kind of the, the obvious response is that your life isn't empty because then your life is full because of what Jesus has accomplished and your life is hidden in his. That's a, a big theme in Colossians chapter 3. So what we're moving from is we're moving from indistinguishable noise to now we have full clarity where we begin to see and hear and understand what matters. 
look, I may have downplayed a couple of things over the last couple of days, you know, like, like grades and sports and, and, you know, your girlfriend or boyfriend. Look, your grades do matter. Your sports do matter. Your, your questions that you have about the future and about the hope in the world, they matter. Who you date, I think it matters a little bit. But I don't think any of them actually matter more than Jesus. I think a good word for this, and, and I'm not, I'm riffing right now, is stewardship. What do I do with something that doesn't belong to me? So we have a responsibility. If my life is not my own, who's, who's, who do I live it for then? Do I live it for in honor and glory of the one who owns it, who bought it, who purchased it with his own blood? Or do I blow it? In the same way, like, don't be a lazy athlete. Like, one of my least favorite things in kids who walk. Can I get an amen? Stop walking at practice. You make me want to throw water bottles. <laughs> Not doing your homework. <laughs> Not being a good steward of the thing that God has given you. Again, but I don't think any of these things matter more than Jesus. And I think unless you can hear that first, where that becomes the clearest thing to us, where it's the most amplified sound in our lives, then I think we're always going to get sucked into this noise. But, but Paul doesn't want you to forget, though, that this is the best part about our identities after we come to Jesus. He says, and in Christ, you have been brought, you have been brought to fullness. It would be a lie from the pit of hell to try to convince you that you are empty with Jesus. I think when you are with Jesus, there's no space that has to be filled. There's, no, there's nothing lacking. When you've got Jesus, you're the fullest that you've ever been in your life. Again, I could aim my desire somewhere else and hope that that, that would be the thing to fill me. Let me give it to you in another way. How many of you know Psalm 23? Awesome. Now, I need your help with this because um, I don't remember how it quite goes. Okay. The Lord is my shepherd. I, I prefer the version where it says, I lack nothing. And the psalmist keeps going. He anoints my head with oil and my cup runs over. I like the 23rd Psalm because it points us to what Christ will do, that with him there is nothing lacking. We shall not want, that we are not just full, but our lives are spilling over as a result. You are full in that your identity is a son and a daughter, and that you are completely loved no matter what your accomplishments are. You are full in that the scriptures say that you are set apart, you're a holy person, you are royalty in the eyes of God. You've been chosen, you've been set apart for Jesus, at whatever moment you're in, at this stage of your life, whether at home or at school or at church, you are, you are full in the fact that the Bible says you are God's workmanship. You're unique. You're one of a kind. You're a work of art. You are his craftsmanship, and he loves to behold you. And you don't have to be anything different in terms of other groups of other people. You are exactly whom Jesus loves and he died for. You are full in that when we feel like we're not sure what to do or think about Jesus, it's to know that Jesus has never stopped thinking about you. I think this is like one of those easy things that we, we forget. I think it feels a little weird that the king of the universe has probably got something better to do than to think about me. But every moment is with you in mind. Here's a, here's a fun one. Do you know that Jesus is praying for you? <laughs> Isn't that wild? He is praying for you. This is what Hebrews 7.25 says. that Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus, day by day, is pleading your case to the Father. I love this idea. John Calvin, he wrote this a long, long time ago. Um, he said, he said when the, whenever the Father is inclined to look at our sin, Jesus redirects his gaze and says, no, 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 no. You look at me, not at them. 
Isn't that awesome? Jesus is actually praying for you. If you just knew how much Jesus was praying for you right now, you wouldn't live with fear. You wouldn't live with anxiety. You wouldn't live with worry. You wouldn't live in that state of constant emptiness, but you would know that every single moment you are on his mind. Every moment at the cross, every moment at the resurrection, every moment at the right hand of the Father, every moment in his return And it's with Jesus that you're finally able to hear what matters. And what we hear is that because of what Jesus has has done, we hear that we matter. We matter to him. This is where I think other forms of noise in the world get this wrong. Because they want us to believe that, that we matter when we do something. But Jesus says that we matter because he did something. That's pretty freaking sweet. Amen? Let's try again one more time. That's pretty sweet. Amen? Amen. That was good, guys. I do think that there's a lingering bit of hopelessness surrounding all of this good, though, that we're talking about. Because I still think that, that the noise, something other than Jesus, has got some of us under lock and key. But we're reading Colossians chapter 2, and the best thing that we can say about that is not today, Satan, not today. Not a chance in hell is your life outside of his possession. And I mean that in the fullest sense of like Trinitarian theology where Jesus conquers sin, death, hell, and darkness. Right at the end of verse 10, Paul says this. He says, he is the head over every power and every authority, not even the forces of the world that hold you hostage have power over you when Jesus is involved. He is over every power, every authority. This is where Paul begins to make this case very, very serious. He says noise really isn't just noise. Noise is vile, it's vindictive, it's mean-spirited. It will manipulate you into believing that there is no freedom possible and that you'll have to live emptying it for the rest of your lives. But this is the battle that we can't see that is waging for who you are. This is the battle for our hearts, that there's some force that's not good, that's not Jesus, that exists in the world, that is at work against us. But but Paul is going to tell us a few verses later in verse 15 that these forces can't hold you prisoner anymore. In verse 15, he says, and having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he went full-blown Chuck Norris on them, and he made a spectacle, a public spectacle He pulled their pants down and he laughed at them. Like, deep pants, the throne of darkness, and I absolutely love it. Triumphing over them by the cross. You won't find that in your typical Sunday school class, by the way. Here's what Colossians 2.15 says. They've been beaten, they've been made a laughing stock of, and they've been disarmed, and so the enemy of our emptiness is gone, and fullness is ours. Fullness is yours. Fullness is yours. I think part of the reality of the Christian is to claim that identity in Christ. The Satan is a liar. He's a thief, he's a cheater, he's a dirty, rotten scoundrel. And anything other that would try to convince me of that is wrong. Because I am full. I'm overflowing. I've never lacked anything with Christ. I've never ever lacked anything in Christ. So I want to do something with you this morning that I think is going to be helpful for your long-term spiritual growth. I want you to take that fasting thing seriously, guys. Because you're too distracted. You have too many other desires. And no one else is going to put Jesus at the center for you. What I want to do with you this morning is I want to help you cultivate the rhythm of silence in a world of noise. I think, I think noise is a good metaphor for the kind of the empty promises that the world gives. Um, but sometimes noise is just real, right? It's just unnecessary and lifeless things. Um, maybe the noise that you're facing is just actual noise. We're just too distracted. We just can't focus. You know, you're so dang busy. You're so awfully distracted. You know, I, I don't know. I'm not a teenager, but I would guess that being you is hard. I've got three kids. I don't want it to be hard for them as their dad. And so sometimes I have to remind myself and I have to remind my children 
that it's okay for us to be human beings and not human doings. You see what I mean? We're not human doings. We're human beings. And so what I have to do from time to time to help me learn that Jesus is enough is I have to get rid of that noise that can be louder than what Jesus has said and done. And so I have to choose to refuse to be noisy myself. So what I do is I take moments in silence. I don't do it to think. I'm not working through problems. I'm not tapping my foot. I'm not shaking my hands. I'm not clicking a pen. I'm not rolling something in my fingers. I'm not playing with my phone. I'm not looking around the room. What I do is I close my eyes and I refuse every other voice except the voice of the Lord's. And this is the same one that's filled me, who did not leave me empty, but he knows me and he desires me and he's kept me on his mind. And what do I do? I just, I just practice being with him. So what we are going to do this morning is we're going to practice being with Jesus. And it's going to be a little weird. It's going to be a little wild. Because what we're going to do is we're going to do five minutes of silence together. How many of you, that feels like a lot? Should we have just started with like 30 seconds? Ah, tough. I already put a five-minute timer on the slide. Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get incredibly uncomfortable. Can I just make a comment real quick? I think it's uncomfortable because you've been accustomed to being a prisoner. And freedom is a little scary. So I want you to sit up straight, both feet on the floor. A little posture check, I like that. What I want you to do is as you're sitting, I want you to lay your hands facing upward on your knee. Sit up straight, lay your hands facing upward on your knee. Open them out. You've got something to receive. You can open them up. And I want you to close your eyes. Part of this is disciplining yourself to not look around. And I want you to take a deep breath. And what we're going to do is we're going to enter silence together. But before we do, let me pray to start us out, and I'm going to close in prayer. What you're going to be tempted to do is to look at your buddy, to look at the timer on the screen. I don't. Please don't. Take a big, deep breath, and when your mind thinks of something else, put it out. Maybe you just focus on who Jesus is, what he's done, who you are in him. We're going to do five minutes in complete silence. Okay, Father, would you meet us? Would you give us the peace and the comfort of your Holy Spirit? Would you remind us of what Christ has secured for us? We don't have anything to be worried about. This is what freedom looks like when nothing is expected of me, nothing is demanded of me. But I get to behold being a son, and we get to hold, behold being sons and daughters together. Or how great it is to be in your presence to behold your glory. Would you meet us now as we enter into silence? All right, take that big deep breath. We're going to start the timer now.
Lord, you've held us up for five minutes, and uh, we made it. We made it in your power, and we made it in your strength. We're so grateful. Amen. How was it? Would you do it again? I don't have a 10-minute exercise, I promise. Was it hard? How many of you think it was hard? I think it was hard. What did you notice? Somebody want to share something? A lot of you I saw like rolling your necks in your head. You got like, you got, everybody knows that your neck hurts a little bit. It's interesting. Um, there's a, a lot of, about this, I think, in the emotional intelligence field, uh, as well as like physiology. Um, that your body keeps everything, every bit of, of trauma and every bit of experience and, and kind of the emotional ups and downs. So it would, be, it would be normal for you to realize, you go, oh, my shoulders and my neck hurt in moments of silence because you've actually slowed down your life enough to pay attention to where your body is holding things like tension and stress. I think it's a good signal that we live too fast. That we've got to slow down to remember that, you know what? I'm not okay and I can't live at that pace forever. The reason why a practice like that is so important is because it is the, it's the exact opposite of the way that we've been conditioned to live. Where I think we've been conditioned to live like prisoners. You're always at the mercy of the noise. And what it is is an invitation to start living like Jesus, who is enough in the middle of all of the noise. So I want to give you another challenge. Uh, I still want you to fast and want you to take that seriously. But, but I want to challenge you as well that while you are in this season of fasting and in the season of letting Jesus meet your wants, is I want you to do what we just did for the next several days until April 1st. Like, it'll be like a maximum of like 15 minutes, and I think you could probably spare it. You're just going to do five minutes a day for the next several days. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It'll look like it'll be 20 minutes. Five times four, fact check me. All right, I think we're good. And what I want you to do is I just want you to try me. Try me on it. And I think what you'll find is that you won't want the noise anymore. You won't want empty promises. And that what I pray is what you'll find is that you'll find that you've developed a hunger for the real thing, which is Jesus. That he can be enough. He can satisfy you. So when you're going a little stir crazy and you want to open up Snapchat or TikTok and keep your street going, whatever it is that you do, you, you love watching you know, uh, reels of, of people I love the one where people get hurt riding skateboards. Those are some of my favorite ones. So when you feel that, you can, I gotta take five minutes. Because I feel a want and a desire and a hunger just kind of welling up inside of me. And I gotta shut it all out and center my life on Jesus. Again, the best thing with Jesus is right in front of you and no one is gonna come do it for you. It will be because you make the day by day by day by day by day by day. Every day that ends in why decision. To see that Jesus is enough for you. And I think that there's something exciting ahead for you if you'll just do that. Let me pray. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for our time together. We thank you that we don't need to be held captive anymore. Lord, let us not grow accustomed to life in prison. Lord, let us be reminded of what it means to live free for your sake, for your purposes. Lord, you've called us to, to not live in darkness, but to flourish and grow in the light of your son, Jesus. Lord, may we relish in the fact, may we celebrate, may we just be so happy that darkness doesn't have a say over us anymore. That emptiness isn't the loudest voice ringing through in our lives. It's already been rendered null and void. We're still laughing over darkness's attempt at trying to stop you from saving us. 
Lord, just as we near kind of the end of this week and Holy Week, as we go to our Good, Good Friday and Easter, Lord, may we, may we celebrate with the church across the globe that though darkness celebrated as if it had won, Lord, a couple days later, we celebrate because it's Jesus who was victorious. I pray that you'll meet us in the season. I pray that we know that we are deeply loved. In Christ's name, amen. Let's stand and worship together. We're going to sing this next song. It's called Hymn of Heaven. Um, before we do, I just want to encourage you to something. I think that we live in a world that constantly moves, that we always want to be entertained when we're doing something. Um, because of that, sometimes worship and sometimes spending time in silence can feel like a waste of time. It can feel dumb. Um, like there's so many better things to be doing in our lives. Um, I know I felt like that in high school. I thought this whole faith thing was a waste of time, that I had better things to be doing with my life. Um, but you know, when I started opening myself up and closing down those lies. And I started shutting out the noise that said that my time was better than what God had to offer me. I started to experience the fullness of who God is in me. I started to experience the fullness of life with Jesus. And I want that for you. I know that I don't know you. We don't know you, but we want that for you. And we're praying that for you. Um, so during this next song, I just want to invite you to sing to open your hands up if that feels natural to you and to receive these words because there is fullness of God that he's offering you today. And we're gonna experience that in heaven. And that's what this song is about. It's about longing and having these desires for Jesus and how that's gonna be fulfilled. Um, but we can, we can still have a little taste of that. And so I just wanna invite you into that as we sing this next song.
we just thank you for this time of worship. God, you are so great. You are so great, and we just thank you so much that you humbled yourself and you came as a human to walk this earth so that we could be with you for eternity. Jesus, we just thank you. It's your name we pray. Amen. If you leave this place knowing that the fullness of God is offered for you, you can run to him and he's waiting with his arms open. So would you just go knowing that today, that you are a child of God and that he is greater than all the noise that's telling you you're not. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you for worshiping with us. We love doing it with you. Um, and have a great rest of your day in your classroom.